distinguished speakers, professors, educators, students, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Asian Medical Education Alliance webinar 2021 or the third Asian Medical Education Conference organized by Asian Medical Education Alliance and the Faculty of Medicine, Chulalongkorn University. This webinar is one of the activities of the Asian Medical Education Alliance. The Asian Medical Education Alliance was founded in 2017 with collaboration from the medical expert in each Asian country. The Alliance has set its objective to promote medical education in Asian contexts, fostering communications among medical educators in Asia, encouraging and supporting medical education research, collaboration, and sharing best medical education practice in Asia. Due to COVID-19 pandemic, the situation is not possible to organize the on-site conference as before. So this year, the conference has converted the platform to be the webinar. The theme of this year webinar is enhancing student engagement in undergraduate medical education during the COVID-19 pandemic. During the pandemic, we understand that medical education has transformed to include more integrated online platforms. Especially during last year, we have seen the great impact of disruption to medical education. We have learned and gained many new insights, which have led us to rethink and reframe the way towards education success. Moreover, we believe that student engagement in medical education will help us to understand our students' needs and expectations, as well as how medical teachers and schools can promote and support our medical students' learning to achieve their learning goals. We think that virtual classes can never replace the original learning experience, but with the shared experiences and insight from all of our esteemed speakers and guests during this webinar, we can share with each other to uncover new roles for educators, students, and medical schools. We are lucky to have internationally famous speakers from abroad to share their experiences. We also recruit medical students' representatives to give their insights. With the recent technology, we can organize live sessions for the participants to communicate with the speakers. This webinar has received attention from 100 participants from worldwide. On behalf of the ASEAN Medical Education Alliance and the Faculty of Medicine, Chulalongkorn University, I would like to thank all the speakers who contribute to this webinar. I would like to thank the Faculty of Medicine, Chulalongkorn University, and the organizing committee who has done their hard work to make this webinar possible. I hope that the participants will enjoy this webinar and further improve the medical education in Asian. I therefore take this opportunity to declare the opening of Asian Medical Education Alliance webinar 2021. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Sutipong Vachanasin, our Dean of Faculty of Medicine, Chulalongkorn University, Bangkok, Thailand. Now may I introduce myself. I am Dr. Tanapop Bampengkietekun. I'm going to be your moderator for today, ASEAN Medical Education Alliance Webinar 2021. May I introduce our two distinguished speakers. Our first speaker is Professor Lola Rao. She is Deputy Dean of School of Medicine, University of Leeds, United Kingdom. Her field of interest is education portfolio leadership and medical education. She was honored with University Teaching Fellowship and Senior Fellowship of the UK Higher Education Academy. Our next speaker is Ms. Laura Smith. She is also Deputy Dean in School of Medicine, University of Leeds in the United Kingdom. And she is also the Head of Clinical Skills Education. Her field of interest is urgent and emergency care, workplace-based assessment, simulation and digital transformation. Please welcome. Hello, 
My name is Laura Stroud and I'm the Deputy Dean of Medicine in the School of Medicine at the University of Leeds. Education is at the centre of my portfolio with my Chair in Public Health and Education Innovation. I'm also the Deputy, I'm also the Director of the Leeds Institute for Medical Education. I'm also delighted to welcome my esteemed colleague, Laura Smith, who's the head of our clinical skills and an innovative medical educator to share this presentation with me. The title of our talk today is Engaging Students in Educational Transformation, Lessons from the Pandemic. And I would like to thank you all warmly for asking us to share our experiences during this most extraordinary of times. What we have learned, how we've engaged with students and our community throughout the first wave of our pandemic. However, in the UK, as you may be aware, we are heading into another period of intense concern, but we believe that the general principles remain. Indeed, as we move to the next slide. Next, sorry, it's the next slide, Laura. That's it. We hold um, Aspire Awards because nothing comes of nothing. And during the pandemic, we've been able to build on the significant work that we've already undertaken in Leeds. We hold the six awards, which we gained over the last six years, with student engagement and assessment being our first in 2014. These two awards have particular resonance since engagement broadly, and more specifically in feedback, workplace-based assessment and learning have been key drivers of our ability to rapidly respond. Next slide, please. So how did we start? This was the UK context in February, March. The headlines and the media representation facing us as staff and students. Nonetheless, moving on a year, none of us expected to be where we are now, facing further significant lockdown measures in order to protect frontline services in the NHS. Next slide, please. So this sense of urgency continues. But last March, as the impact of the coronavirus emerged, there was a real sense of national urgency. The university in Leeds pivoted online almost overnight. This meant staff and students felt dislocated, not least having to get to grips with new platforms, in our case, Microsoft Teams, over sometimes flaky internet connections and home equipment that was less than optimal. But almost as rapidly, the human responses emerged that were strangely bonding. Phrases, you're on mute, legacy hand, and the wave at the end of the session became signifiers of a new way of interacting, and this became really important in helping us to bond. So whilst there was a lot of physical community, these new ways of reconnecting with the human, really important, but it did and does take effort. More seriously, our students were grappling with, for the first time in their lives, the possibility of unexpected premature loss in their families, and worse, the fear that they would bring infection into their homes. Our responsibility was to engage with them, informing them of the evidence as it emerged, particularly as the differential impact on minority ethnic communities became clearer. The university developed its pandemic plan with medicine playing a key role in both the harnessing of the science and the frontline response. At this point, I'm going to hand over to my colleague, Laura, to describe the impact on education and how we developed our response. Thank you, Laura. So first of all, I think it would be helpful to explore how the um, pandemic impacted um, the clinical services that provide our placements for our students. Laura's already provided us with some insight into the implications for teaching on campus and teaching delivery and student life in general. However, the impact on the clinical environment was really quite significant. And considering our students spend 75% of their programme time in placement across the five years, that was really quite a key and important factor for us to consider in terms of how our students learn. So there was transformation of clinical services and teams. So specialty areas were no longer functioning the way that they were before. And we moved to having hot and cold areas, um, which obviously had um, designated sort of COVID areas and increased ICU capacity, which was something that was different in terms of how our services normally function. Lots of services were halted. Elective surgery particularly um, was impacted by this. Um, and again, that had implications for our students on placement um, and exposure to such, such clinical specialties. There was massive redeployment of clinical teams. Um, 
and having to upskill clinical staff into roles that perhaps they had not done for some time or roles that were unfamiliar to them and the formation of new teams. Um, and, and that had huge implications for staff well-being um, and morale generally. But people embraced that and, and, and accepted the change and worked together as teams um, and took on these new working practices. So things um, that have been really significant in terms of how our students learn are around online consultations, particularly in family medicine and primary care um, and, and outpatients departments. So, for patients, having their consultation online rather than in person was something that was quite a significant change. There's also been changes to clinical guidelines, and we needed to make sure that students were aware of those and were practicing up to date um, clinical procedures, particularly those around aerosol generating procedures, end of life care and acute care. Availability of PPE has been an ongoing issue um, and supply and demand um, has, has been something that has been a concern for NHS staff um, and for clinical services and for ourselves um, as a medical school um, and it's something that we've needed to, um, to address. All of these things have placed constraints on placement provision, um, particularly physical distancing and having students in, in clinical placements. And obviously we've had a duty of care to our students to make sure that they were safe. This meant that for a short period of time, we had to um, cease clinical placements altogether um, and make sure that our students were adequately prepared and that placements were adequately prepared to receive our students back into placement. We were able to do this over the summer um, and our students were um, given key, key worker status, which meant that they were essential staff and they were allowed to go back into placement. And this really propelled all healthcare students to frontline services. And we really needed to engage our students and work with them to make sure that they felt confident, prepared and safe to go back into clinical placements. So how did we achieve this? Well, we built trust and we made sure that we were open and honest with our students um, and that their well-being was paramount. We wanted them to know that that was important um, and that this wasn't about just getting them through the programme and making sure that they could graduate. It was about making sure that they could do that safely um, and that their well-being was safeguarded through that process. We achieved this using a model of engagement that involves collaboration, co-production and community. These are principles which underpin our, our student engagement philosophy. Um, and I'll explore these a bit further now. So within, the, within our response, in the urgent phase, um, we really were in sort of a crisis mode. Things happened so quickly. Um, and we had to really pull together as a senior team and as a team within the school. And I think Laura's already outlined that actually we were geographically um, separated. And that meant that we needed to come together in online platforms and work together and rapidly respond to sort of evolving situations and, and put a huge amount of time into intensive planning um, and explore multiple scenarios and, and really make some educated guesses around what was gonna happen next to make sure that we could respond appropriately and we weren't just being reactive. I think the key component here, certainly within this urgent phase, is that communication was key. And we kept open lines of communication with students, placement providers, and amongst ourselves. Um, and it was this, that, this open and honest um, communication that, that helped us build um, our trust with our students. So this is our, um, some of our senior team um, who've really been um, fundamental in sort of driving the leadership um, of the programme through this difficult period. Um, and it is this strong leadership that's helped us to navigate some of these really difficult situations and decisions. Um, and actually, we've been incredibly visible to students um, and, and have met with students regularly to make sure that we are visible, we are answering their concerns, and we are working together with them um, to get through this difficult time. Um, these are unprecedented times. Without doubt, this um, pandemic is not something that any of us have experienced before, and it will have had a significant impact on how we deliver medical education now, but forevermore. Um, and, and certainly, it's something that we need to work with students to get through. 
So, um, in terms of how it's changed education and how we deliver our education, we have made significant changes and, and they have been driven by the pandemic. Um, as Laura said, we, we have our Aspire Awards and we are already well known for developing our curriculum and looking at innovation and innovating and evaluating different ways of teaching. Um, but what we've been able to do is, is rapidly accelerate some of those projects. Um, and I think what the first thing that we had to do was certainly um, in the initial phases was to move content online. So we had to move any theoretical content that we could um, into an online platform, whether um, that be on our virtual learning environment or even delivering teaching via Teams. Um, and we used existing content and repurposed it and we rapidly developed new content as well. Um, as with all healthcare programmes, the more difficult aspect of this was the practical elements of teaching. Things like anatomy, clinical skills, have all been much more complex in terms of how we move those into um, an online environment. And some of it is just not possible to deliver online in the way that we would want to, certainly from a um, a patient safety perspective, there are core graduate outcomes that we need to see that students can do physically. Um, and um, we have been very lucky to have the support of the university to continue to deliver some face-to-face -face teaching, albeit with very strict risk protocols in place, um, so that our students can still um, receive some face-to-face -face teaching. It has allowed us to consider how we teach and what we teach in different ways. And we have taken time to pause and reflect where we've been able and think about how we do things differently. Um, and we've tried to look at things in a, in a really positive way and think, actually, if there is a need here, how does this give us the opportunity to innovate, to do things differently um, and to look at developing new pedagogies that will underpin the way that we teach medicine in the future? And more than anything, we've been able to do this at a pace, a much more accelerated pace than we would have ever otherwise thought was possible. Um, and we've achieved so much within that time. One of the most, um, the most challenging things that we, we've had to do um, really is that we received a mandate from our government asking us to graduate our students as soon as practically possible. Um, during the first phase of the pandemic. This required us to um, completely um, revise our assessment strategy and there were implications for our end of year exams. And we had to work very closely with the um, foundation schools and the medical schools council to consider how we could safely graduate students into clinical practice so that they could join the workforce early um, as interim foundation doctors and support the care of patients during this difficult time. But we wanted to make sure that students felt supported and prepared to be able to do this. We were able to use um, programmatic assessment data that we gathered on students, um, about students throughout the programme to help inform these decisions. And we, we were able to graduate 195 of our final year cohort early into clinical practice. Students were then given the option whether to take up an interim foundation post and some students um, obviously due to caring reasons or needing to shield or for other personal reasons were not able to do this, but the vast majority did. To make sure that students were supported through this process, we provided COVID related preparatory sessions in clinical skills. We established a mentor scheme where every student who graduated early was provided with a, a, a qualified clinician as a mentor to help them through this difficult period um, and to provide an additional level of support above what was provided by the foundation school. And this evaluated very well by, by students um, and graduates. Once we'd done this, we were looking at, at helping students return to clinical placements. So students who'd missed some placement um, in year four, we were, um, were given the opportunity to um, attend a recovery placement over the summer period. Um, however, they were going back into a very different workplace to the one that they'd left. 
So um, we needed to do a lot of work to help prepare students to go back into placement. And this wasn't just to help make sure that students felt prepared and safe to go back into these environments, but also so that we could provide reassurances for our placement providers that students had had this information and were adequately prepared. We recognised that the workforce were already under significant pressure and we didn't want to put um, additional pressures on the work on the clinical workforce to need to provide this training for students on site. All students pro were provided with um, individual risk assessments to make sure that they were safe to go back into clinical placements and where necessary they were referred to occupational health for additional support. Students were provided with scrubs. This may seem like a small thing, but actually um, all clinical staff um, within our placement um, providers were wearing scrubs, but there was not sufficient to be able to provide enough for all our students. So we didn't want students to feel that they needed to wear their own clothes for placement and provide an additional risk um, when they were going into areas that were a concern. So we provided these for students. We made sure that, sure that students had adequate um, access to PPE and that all trusts um, were aware of the protocol in terms of providing PPE for students. We established a programme of e-learning to help students um, prepare for going back into placements. This covered um, infection prevention. Um, we also covered um, information on um, where and, and how they could um, report if they were symptomatic or needed to self-isolate. There were updates on clinical changes um, to guidance um, and students um, were all um, asked to complete this as a mandatory requirement before going back into placement. We also established um, online resources for students that were a single point of information and a single point of contact. This meant that students could access the reporting tool if they became symptomatic or needed to isolate. All of the examples that I've just given um, of the things that we've, did, we've done during this um, pandemic would not have been possible without collaboration with our key partners. That includes Medical Schools Council, the Medical School Assessment Alliance, the General Medical Council and Health Education England. Working together, we've been able to navigate some of the challenges that the pandemic has presented for all medical schools on a national um, scale. Um, and it's enabled us to look at the national picture and make a collective decision and collective response. And I think this has been fundamental in helping us engage our students. So this isn't, these decisions have not been made by individual institutions, but the expertise has come together um, and made the decisions that have been in the best interest of students nationally. And sharing this best practice um, across medical education has really been um, a change in how we work together with these key stakeholders. We've also been able to share our innovations and resources. This has meant that students have had access to resources that would not necessarily be available to them. And should we have made them ourselves, we just wouldn't have been able to make them available in such a timely manner. I wanted to let you know about a couple of these resources and, and how we've used them in terms of our teaching. So, um, these resources um, on this slide are, are called Capsule and Clinically Speaking. These are both resources that have been made um, by individual um, medical schools and have been used by indiv individual medical schools up until the point of the pandemic. Um, those schools then made these resources available to all um, schools through um, the Medical Schools Council. So Capsule is a quiz-based learning resource designed to support um, undergraduate medical students um, and their application of knowledge in a clinical setting. And it provides over 600 clinical cases, um, which we've been able to utilize um, to support and enhance teaching that we already deliver. Clinically speaking is a, um, a bit, essentially it's got 900 patient cases in there and it's patients talking about their own disease um, and their own illness. And it helps students um, to really think about and understand um, the disease and how it impacts on patients in practice. And we've been able to, de to develop um, educational resources using these um, existing resources from other medical schools um, to address gaps in our own teaching. 
um, which is something that, that is really quite new to us. Um, the next slide, um, I'm going to hand back to um, Professor Stroud so that she can talk to you a little bit about a project that we have been involved with. So, so virtual primary care is something I'm particularly proud of, and I'd really like to share this as a bit of a case study with you. Um, this is both collaborative and co-production. Um, as Laura's described, medical schools came together quite early in the pandemic with a small working group of which I was fortunate to be an invited member of to sort of consider what resources we have that we could make available to support education and actually the future medical workforce um, during this extraordinary time. So, you know, there were some existing resources, but actually the big gap that was identified by one of my colleagues is in primary care and in family medicine. So one of my colleagues, um, Jane Kirby, had already been talking to me about a local a, a TV company called Knickerbocker Glory, which has been making for the last few years um, a TV program called GP Behind Closed Doors. And she said, well, you know, we can't get authentic um, GP consultations, but the TV program has, um, has this in abundance. So she contacted the program who would actually furloughed much of their staff and said, could we have access to some of your consultations? Um, of which there was a very positive response. So from there, we thought, well, actually we could do this as leads, but actually we should perhaps be thinking about how we can really add value in this particular time and get together with lots of heads of teaching and primary care and decide whether we could make this something much bigger. From there, I introduced Jane to um, one of the, the chief executive officer of um, Medical Schools Council, and they were incredibly interested in saying, well, actually, let's do this for all medical schools and see what we can do. So working in collaboration and in cooperation and co-production with the TV company, other medical schools, heads of teaching and primary care, and ultimately our students, we've been able to produce a really high quality, high definition resource that enables not just primary care consultation, but actually the full run through from primary care into referrals, into secondary and tertiary care and back again, including high definition footage of what happens when patients are arriving at the GP surgery or health centre and what happens after the consultation. So the full range of interactions are possible to be used to show what that end to end patient experience is. The resource is taggable. Um, so for the first time, we can stratify by demographic, by age, by condition, by multimorbidity, you know, by ethnicity, so that we can use this resource in a variety of ways, dependent on where it can fit into our spiral curricula. Um, because of the way we all came together to work together, this resource has been produced in four months and no single medical school would have been able to do that, um, you know, without the support of others. So I think not only has it been intensely important during the phase of the pandemic when many of our students can't go into GP surgeries, it's also enabled us to address an area which is ready for curriculum refresh um, and in particular to make sure that our, our resources are properly reflective of the communities that we serve. Um, I'll come back and talk a little bit more about that later on, but I'm going to hand back to Laura at this point. Thanks, Laura. So one of the things that um, I've sort of highlighted is the impact on clinical placements and access to supervised practice and effective feedback has always been a challenge for medical education. Um, and particularly that's been exacerbated through this pandemic. Um, and we needed to make sure that our students had access to learning opportunities that made sure that they were adequately prepared to go into placements. Um, and one of the ways that we've done this is by further developing our established um, simulation strategy. Um, we've always um, em embedded simulation um, within the acute care strand of our curriculum um, and have done a lot of work on this over the last few years. However, what we've done over the last um, six to nine months really um, is develop um, some new different types of simulation that have really um, just come to the forefront in terms of looking at where the gaps were um, for our students. So um, we've established SECO, which is safe and expected clinical outcomes. And, and essentially the students run through a series of consultations um, as they would in a clinic, but they lead them. 
Um, so it allows them to practice their consultation skills, clinical reasoning and decision making. And they do this in a safe environment um, with the feedback and support of clinicians. Um, we've also um, acknowledged that students um, are, are not necessarily getting as much exposure to palliative and end of life care um, at this current time. And, and, and again, that's always been um, something that we, we've been trying to develop. Um, but the end of life um, simulation that we've developed in conjunction with our palliative care um, um, consultants and oncologists um, has really helped us to um, provide students with the opportunities to learn how to deal with um, common end of life um, situations that, that patients experience and, and to help students to feel adequately prepared to manage those situations and those conditions. As I said, we have a well-established acute care strand of the curriculum um, that has always evaluated incredibly well. Um, however, what we have done is we've incorporated COVID-related um, scenarios into that strand. Um, and that's not to, um, to make it more complex, but to acknowledge that patients who have multiple um, morbidities or comorbidities will also um, experience COVID and, and managing that is much more complex and we want our students to feel adequately prepared to be able to respond and help in those situations. Um, I explored earlier how um, um, the pandemic has impacted on clinical teams and how we have teams working under significant pressure in unfamiliar environments, in unfamiliar teams and perhaps in unfamiliar roles. Um, and really that's brought to the forefront um, our patient safety curriculum um, and, and how we teach students about human factors. Um, and we're currently doing quite a lot of work to look at how we develop our human factors simulation. Um, and um, after, um, after the, this semester, we will be starting a human factors pilot where students are learning about the impact of human factors on patient safety and latent errors. Um, and that's really something that um, has come out of this pandemic. As part of all of this, we've also been looking at technological solutions, um, particularly those around augmented and virtual reality, and what opportunities they offer us in terms of clinical skills and simulation teaching and placement learning. Um, so what we do know is that the situation where we have got physical distancing in clinical environments to the point that we can't have the same number of students, um, that doesn't mean that students can't still learn um, from those clinical experiences. And one way that we've been able to do this is to support um, one of our placement providers um, to establish some hollow lens teaching um, where the um, clinical educator can take a student to the ward um, and wear the HoloLens headset and the other students can be in a classroom environment where they're physically distanced um, in a safer environment um, and, can, and can watch the ward round perhaps from um, a classroom environment whilst one student is with a clinical educator. Um, and the students have, have, have um, participated um, in this as a pilot project. This is something that we're looking to develop further and it also presents opportunities for simulation and sharing simulation teaching more widely um, amongst the students um, and, and those opportunities being available to more students um, in real time um, and um, the flexibility to access them at different times um, to suit themselves. None of what we've achieved would have been possible without the support of our university's digital education service. They've been critical in helping us to signpost and curate online content. Um, we've had academics reviewing um, existing content already um, on our virtual learning environment and updating and preparing new content. Um, we've repurposed and reused what we can, um, but also, like I said before, we're developing new content and we've already developed quite a lot of new content. We've, um, we've appointed um, six clinical fellows to work on the development of specialty content for um, the programme across all years. Um, and that project um, is well underway um, and is, um, is, is coming together very well. We've also began to look at new technological solutions. So um, within the university, we've always been um, very um, 
on the front foot in terms of working with technology and thinking about how technology can help us address some of the needs of our students. Um, however, the pandemic has allowed us to look at different solutions and different technological partners who we may want to work with going forward. So one of these, um, is, this is just an example, is Proxime. So Proxime is an integrated online platform which was established to help surgeons um, learn surgery um, anywhere in the world. So um, it, it essentially means that any anybody could log into this platform um, and participate and view um, surgical procedures online. Um, and, and it's been a very successful resource for that purpose. But what we saw was we saw the opportunity for it to be used for the areas where perhaps we've thought moving teaching content online has been more difficult. So as I said before, the practical clinical skills teaching really has been um, a challenge in terms of how we teach some aspects of that online. Um, so um, this month we start a project where we are using Proxime to teach clinical examination skills. And this won't be used in isolation. This won't be the only teaching the students receive, but it will be used as a blended approach to learning and used to enhance and augment the face-to-face -face clinical skills teaching that students already um, receive. But what we don't want to do is bring students in um, when we don't need to and when they can access the resources from home and learn in a, in a more personalised way, um, but still in an effective way. We want to be able to um, enable them to do that. So I've given quite a few examples there about how we've collaborated and co-produced um, with not just our, not just our students and our, our placement providers and, and our wider community. Um, and I think that the key to, to the successes that we've had has really been about engaging the whole community um, and harnessing and leveraging that community spirit. There's very much been a we're all in this together approach to, um, to how we've uh, approached the challenges that the pandemic has, has thrown up. Um, but certainly from a student perspective, we may have lost the face-to-face -face contact in the way that we had before with students, but what we have is a much richer dialogue now. So we've had um, fortnightly meetings with our student reps that have been led by the Dean um, and the rest of the senior team attend. Um, we have a very open and honest discussion in those meetings with students and it allows a forum for students to express concerns and ask questions um, and to get a response. We've worked very closely with staff and faculty, both within the school, within the university, um, across um, all the disciplines within the university, and also with our placement providers. Certainly within the wider health community, we've built strong partnerships um, with foundation schools, Health Education England, um, and the General Medical Council. And I've already talked extensively about the work we've done with Medical Schools Council. But I think it's just important to stress really that it is this community um, that's enabled us to engage with our students and to transform medical education in the way that we have over the past nine to 12 months. The other thing that has underpinned um, the work that we've done is, is the model of engagement and this philosophy um, that, that we've, we've taken in terms of how we engage with our students. We've made sure we've listened, we've understood and we've acted on concerns and we've acted on questions and we've provided a response. Um, and it's for us, it was a bit about making sure that we close the loop and that students aren't left wondering or they've asked a question and not had a response. Um, and we've really taken on board student feedback um, and we've said we don't always get it right, but actually working together, we can work through some of these issues. Um, and certainly this has been something that's, that's really been effective for us. So I'll hand over to you now, Laura. So really, um, whilst we can talk about the many, many positives that have arisen from the pandemic, what we can't avoid, um, probably globally, but certainly in the UK, that it has widened health inequalities. And that's not just within society, although that's a very key part of it, it's also within our existing and prospective students as well. We know students suffer from anxiety, loneliness and isolation. Um, they're not in their normal community of practice. So we've strengthened our student support structures. 
Medical students themselves are very good at organising and they've organised cafes to meet and discuss issues that concern them. And again, going back to our engagement, these fortnightly meetings enable us to rapidly respond to the issues that they're raising and to help address them. Moreover, students have rightly challenged us um, constructively about the impact of the pandemic on ethnic minorities brought to the fore in the political movement Black Lives Matters. And we've established new equality, diversity, and inclusion mechanisms and networks. We're meeting regularly and engaging in curriculum refresh and review. And again, this is consistent across medical schools where we're all trying to respond and take the opportunity to leverage change. I think just as we move into the kind of final phase of what we want to talk about today, I'm going to move, actually ask Laura to move on to the next slide. There's a couple of links here to um, the memorial page that the British Medical Journal have used to sort of talk about the doctors in particular lost to COVID um, in the first wave of the pandemic. And I think we should never forget our frontline and healthcare workers who have been incredibly affected by this and the impact that has on the teams that are in the clinical service and for our students. The flip side to that is there's more interest in working in healthcare. Student numbers and applications are up. Um, it's seen to be something that has been coming together. However, as we move into a new and critical phase of the pandemic in the UK, we can't really forget to think about what we've learned and what we take forward into the future. So what does that future look like and how do we safely continue with an accelerated pace of change? There are lots of unknown. Um, you know, there's changes in healthcare delivery, which Laura's outlined, there's an NHS recovery period and all of the work that hasn't been done in the NHS to cope with the effects of COVID. We need to ensure that we adapt our curriculum to ensure that our students are adequately prepared for practice when they haven't had the normal learning opportunities that they would have had previously. We need to think about how technology will continue to help us to transform medical education positively. So our commitment is to develop curricula that are inclusive, open and explicitly address inequalities to influence healthier outcomes so that our graduates are socially accountable, global citizens and an increasingly digital future. But importantly, they are compassionate, collaborative practitioners. So finally, just thinking about the future, we've achieved a lot in a difficult journey that's not over yet. We know that what we've done to this point is still very much in crisis mode. So moving forward by working collaboratively with partners, we know that we can achieve so much more. And I'd just like to end by saying thank you for listening and our email addresses are at the end. And we hope that when there are questions, we'll be able to respond to those. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Professor Laura and Ms. Smith, and both of you will be with us at the Q&A session. And now we will move to the next symposium. It will be a symposium on the topic of enhancing student engagement in undergraduate medical, uh, undergraduate medical education during the COVID-19 pandemic. And we have four representatives from four Asian countries, uh, one of them, uh, the first of them is the, our third year medical student from Thailand, uh, Ms. Natasha Sitawat Pong. She is a third year undergraduate medical student from Faculty of Medicine, Tulalongkorn University, Bangkok, Thailand. She is now head of the academic affairs of the student union. She is a member of the student engagement team and also the member of the COVID-19 response team. Her field of interest for now is only medical education. Please welcome. Thank you, Dr. Tanapo. I'm honored to be here in the ASEAN Medical Education Alliance webinar and have the opportunity to share the experiences of the Faculty of Medicine, Jalalongkorn University, Thailand. So speaking of enhancing student engagement, I'd like to recommend this medical teacher article published in 2018. It has brought together the Aspire Medical School's experiences to provide 12 tips on how to improve the student engagement to the next level. And I believe medical 
schools are already moving towards these directions prior to the COVID-19 pandemic. But the pandemic has generated unprecedented constraints in teaching and learning, hence the needs and opportunities for students and teachers to coordinate more than ever. So here, I would like to share Julango Medical School's experiences using these tips as a framework to demonstrate how we have enhanced our student engagement during the pandemic. But due to the limited time, I'll bring up just five tips in which I will explain what our medical school already had before the pandemic, how the pandemic affected us, and then how we utilize our strong student faculty relationship to overcome the hardships. Let's get started. Tip one, create a culture that empowers students to be engaged. Jilalongo Medical School had cultivated engagement culture for quite a long time. The evidence can be traced back to 1970 when the inclusion of student representative in the curriculum committee was documented. And we have been in constant development ever since. After the achievement of the Aspire Award of Excellence in Student Engagement in 2015, we further developed the Student Engagement Committee under the supervision of the academic affairs. The structure is as follows. As you can see here, it comprises students from each year, the class presidents, and the heads of the Student Engagement Working Group, and the teachers with the goal to enhance medical education here in our medical school. The team facilitates the coordination between the students and the faculty. When students have issues and feedback, they talk to their fellow students in the committee. Then the team will collaborate with the teachers to work out the educationally sound solutions and the implementation will be communicated to their peers to keep the students in the loop of what we are doing. So to reflect upon the situation at our medical school, I've seen continuous improvement in action. The classes got improved every single year and many of the changes were from our feedback. And I was so proud. And so you can see that the teachers truly listen to us and they're so eager to improve our educational experiences along with the empowerment of the student union where everyone can initiate anything. We, the young minds, believe in the power of the students that we are partners in making positive impacts to our medical school. And this normal or normal culture is definitely a not so secret weapon when the disruption came. So when the world's first COVID-19 case outside China was reported in Thailand in January, things had been fine until mid-March. Then the situation got much worse and the government suddenly ordered a nationwide lockdown forcing all academic activities to go online. Nobody would have anticipated a pandemic like this and the uncertainty created stairs in both learning and well-being. And this is when the next tip came into action. Second tip, create a framework for formal student engagement. In this tip, it is suggested that within the organization, there should be a clear formal framework stating how students interact with the faculty to make sure that the student voices are incorporated into the decision-making. As mentioned earlier, Jilalongo Medical School has a big formal body for the Student Engagement Committee with the firm framework that plays a major role in enriching our engagement culture. But the COVID-19 require 
a timelier and quicker response. So we needed an easy to mobilize team to tackle these intensive tasks. Thus, the academic affairs formation of a small but really efficient team based on the student engagement group. And the COVID-19 response team was formed. It consisted of both students and teachers as always. The team specifically tackled the COVID-19 related problems in which there were three main tasks. So for our first task, our goal was in student care. We played a part in evaluation of the students' well-being and providing prompt responses to students' concerns. During the initial period of the lockdown, we evaluated various aspects of student lives, like how they're feeling, where they live, and the hardship they might be facing. We also provided a specific communication channel for students who needed the faculty's assistance. So the faculty contacted the students who needed help individually. For example, the students who needed the financial aid, students who needed the online psychological support. And moreover, the medical school also provided the COVID-19 insurance for every student. So overall, we can say that each student was taken care of holistically during the hard time. So that was our first task. Let's move on to the next, our second task. In the organization of the remotely invigilated iPad-based examination, we helped design the rules to prevent the possible loopholes and design the evaluation of the examination. This topic will be discussed more in the next tip. And then the third task, we collected data of an issue that arose abruptly to support the student representation in the curriculum committee. So these were what just a small group of seven people did within just over a month. Hence, this illustrates how we created a formal body that suits this task and managed to coordinate and respond in a timely manner to reach out to all students for the best possible management during the lockdown. Um, so the tip three, maximize feedback in student to student and student to faculty communication. This tip suggests that communication should be optimized and resulting in a close feedback loop where the student voices should be communicated to the right teachers. And then the outcome should be communicated back to the students as it is crucial for them to know that their voice matters. To illustrate, I'd like to tell you about our first remotely invigilated iPad this examination. So despite the fact that our students were familiar with the on-site iPad-based exam already, our medical school never held any remotely invigilated exam and let alone simultaneously organizing that for 300 people. But the pandemic forced our medical schools to do that for our first year medical students. At first, the students' impression of the remote exam was that it was really likely to be unfair as there were so many things that could go wrong. Because of its high stake, the students were involved in every step. The whole thing began on April 30th, that the decision was made to employ the remote exam. And af right after that, the COVID team discussed extensively to shape the rules with these possible loopholes. And then on the 19th, in the student engagement committee meeting, a draft of the exam regulation was presented and the head of the exam committee came to meet the students. 
Once the regulations were nearly finalized, we knew which tech devices were required for the exam. Then we sent out a Google form to evaluate the students' electronic devices and the remote exam size preparedness. And there were two students with the need for the new iPads. So our medical school then shipped the iPads straight to their home. Then the mock exam was organized on May 1st to ensure that the real exam would go smoothly. Then after the mock exam, we conducted an immediate survey to evaluate the perceptions and concerns after the student's first exposure to the exam and its protocol. And the most significant result was that the students were concerned about how they were not allowed to go back to the previous questions. So that night, there was a meeting between the assistant dean of the academic affairs with the whole class of year one students to answer the inquiries and the students could voice any concerns directly to him. He then brought the significant concerns to the examination management committee on May 5th after the faculties through consideration of the regulations. The students were informed that they would be able to review the previous questions in the real exam. At last, the real exam was then held on May 7th. It went smoothly without any major problems. In the post-examination survey, 92% of the students agreed that the exam was well prepared. Then the students were informed about the successful outcome of the first remote exam shortly after. The result on the survey was used to further improve the next two other remote exams. So as you can see, there were multiple rounds of close communication with regular feedback in each step on various levels. From the COVID-19 team, the student engagement committee, and the whole class. This is a key factor that such a big project could run smoothly without any conflict, despite the time constraints. So in the end, we could achieve what we first thought impossible. So next, tip four, formally include student representatives in governance processes. So this tip suggested that the students should have an active role in governance process more than just basic accreditation requirements. Prior to the pandemic, students already played a significant role in governance processes through student representatives in the curriculum committee. The curriculum committee comprises the course conveners and the student representatives who are the class presidents and the heads of the student engagement each year. During normal times, the curriculum committee mainly oversees the courses, learning experiences, and educational resources. But in the COVID-19 era, the unpredictability raised so many questions among the students, especially ones regarding the educational planning. For example, will the exam be called off? Or do I have to take an online exam? Or when will the university resume the on-campus teaching? This is when we utilize our existing strong students faculty communication system. The student representation in the governance process was utilized more frequently, multiple meetings, and mainly discussing the options to maximize students' learning opportunities within the constraints from the lockdown. So overall, we can say that the pre clerkship students had a comparable education by learning online, but 
it was not so simple for the clerkship students, especially the externs. In Thailand, externs are the sixth year medical students who practice as if being a real doctors, but just under close supervision. Being externs is already hard in itself, but working amid the COVID-19 is even more challenging. The COVID-19 situation peaked right before the beginning of the externship. It created a mixed feeling in ways that the students wanted to learn and gain their experiences to be a competent practitioner. But they were so concerned, also concerned for their safety, fear of contracting COVID. So the student representatives gathered the externs to be his concerns and brought the issues up to the faculty. There were multiple discussions in the curriculum committee involving all the stakeholders on how to maximize learning opportunities within the safety. With the help of the student perception survey by the COVID team to assist the evidence-based decision-making, there came the intervention. First, for scheduling, surprisingly, the survey revealed that the externs to be valued practicing outside the King Jalalanga Memorial Hospital even more than not contracting the disease. Hence, the beginning of the externship two weeks earlier than previous schedule to maintain the allocated time for practicing outside the King Jalalanga Memorial Hospital. And then to maximize safety, there's the guideline of what clinical procedures externs are or are not allowed to do by a team of infectious disease specialists. And we also have the dormitory guideline for the COVID-19 prevention, which the student rep play a significant role in outlining the regulations with the student affairs. So the student representatives has utilized their role in formal governance process to proactively find the best solution. Right after the concern arise, they conveyed the class concerns, bridging the understanding of the teachers and the students. This show the culture of empathy towards each other in our medical school. And the last tip, tip 12. So we did not just stop at the crisis management mentioned in the first four tips, but we also seized this unique opportunity to engage students in faculty development program. The learning from home created a golden period to explore the integration of new technology in teaching and learning, especially in clinical teaching. Different strategies were employed by different teachers. Therefore, another working team of the Student Engagement Committee gathered the students' online learning experiences and their opinions, and then synthesized them into six main lesson plans plus their derivatives and also comparing the pros and cons along with the suggestion. And all of this was done in just about 20 days. And then they shared the knowledge to more than 170 participants in our med ed talk, which is our faculty development program in April. So it proved that under hardship, there always lie the opportunities to engage students, allowing teachers and students to learn from one another. So after the critical period, the true new normal came for six months. Blended learning strategy was implemented with online lectures and on-site practical classes. 
and the student engagement gets stronger because now we all know how to deal with the unexpected crisis and the students understand the teachers better and we are calmer towards the changes. And even though we are having a new wave right now, we react more calmly and systematically and we will get settled within a shorter period of time. So here are the take home messages. In order to promote student engagement in the pandemic, first, the structure matters. Property information is essential. It was demonstrated by the COVID team's work that had driven several movements. Second, the communication is the key during the crisis. This was illustrated by the remotely invigilated iPad based exam. Communication helped us achieve what we thought impossible smoothly. And third, students can proactively propel the governance processes. You can see by how the externs collaborated with the faculty. And also don't forget to find the silver lining. We couldn't have explored so many teaching plans within less than a month if it wasn't for the pandemic, right? There are always new opportunities to engage students. And go back to the foundation, cultivate culture. Our student engagement culture that had been planted and watered regularly for a quite long time, blew more prominently in crisis. To conclude from a and Southeast Asian girl perspective in our culture, I feel that we often see ourselves as so small being an inexperienced girl, but COVID has proved that in one way, at least for me, that we are powerful and capable of more than we even realized. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Ms. Nastasha, for elaborate explanation and very well uh, example of what we do here in Thailand. So uh, what I have learned from her is that we can learn from each other and also learn together in this hardness of time. And let's move to our next speaker. Uh, he is a fourth year undergraduate medical student from Faculty of Medicine, University of Indonesia. He is also a research intern at Medical Education Center, Indonesian Medical Education and Research Institute. He is a head of Mentoring Division, Department of Academics, Mass Senate of 2017. He is a member of EMSA and peer counselor, student support from the University of Indonesia. Welcome, Mr. Aziz Muhammad Puchera. Okay, so can you guys see my slides? Yes, absolutely. Okay, excellent. Well, good afternoon to all the participants, to my seniors and teachers in the field of medical education. I hope everyone is safe and doing well in the midst of this pandemic. First of all, I would like to, uh, to thank the committees for inviting me to speak here. Um, since long education has been an interest of mine, and it brings me great pleasure to be able to share some of my experiences in Indonesia regarding on how we adapt during this pandemic and the engagement aspect of it. Truly, this pandemic is unlike anything we have seen in the last few decades. The numbers of confirmed cases and deaths continue to, re to rise day by day. And even the vaccines have been developed and distributed, we cannot solely rely on the vaccines as uh, preventive measures still serve as powerful as ever. And it is only by our collaborative efforts and evidence-based practice will we, will we be able to triumph over this pandemic. So of course, the field of medical education is also greatly impacted by this pandemic with most, if not all institutions, and decide to transform the traditional face-to-face -face direct teaching methods to virtual activities, the so-called transition of bedside to website teaching. Of course, con concerns are raised um, to whether students are able to master the necessary competences, especially in the era of outcome-based education, especially when we put into consideration the limited direct encounter with patients 
and practical skills. Of course, a myriad of changes need to be made to cope with the current situation, many of which will persist for the foreseeable future. Um, uh, literatures have described major changes. Yes. Okay. Uh, would you please turn on the full screen mode, please? Oh, okay. Wait a minute. Sorry. Oh. Yes. Uh, no. Okay. Oh, okay. 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 Yeah. Yes. Sorry. Well, thank you. Uh, well, literatures have described the major changes in the areas of medical education. Um, some of which are shown on the screen with um, most countries have withdrawn students from direct face-to-face uh, -face learning activities and um, but actually some decided to um, deploy medical students as backup for uh, professional healthcare workers. The use of virtual learning spaces has never been this big before. Of course, um, the use of virtual learning spaces, uh, they aren't really something new, but th their use um, in this pandemic can even be compared to the period before the pandemic. And of course, this also necessitates changes in assessment methods. And I will uh, talk about this more later on. And some universities have also developed COVID-19 related courses, including our university. And I would love to talk about this later on. And um, faculty development, as well as the well-being of medical students and the faculties are also important aspects that we can overlook. So how do we adapt to this pandemic? Uh, what lessons can we learn from the, the pandemic? Um, this, I think, is an excellent example of collaboration between the faculty and the students. Our faculty has managed to develop a special course called the Response to COVID-19 module. And this course is actually obligatory for all students, both preclinical and clinical years. Um, this module is also obligatory for all freshly graduate students before they can um, do their internship period. Other versions of this module also exist um, for the layman and for the professional healthcare workers. The students, some students actually help manage this module. Uh, they uh, do conduct uh, managing activities of the module, they uh, renew the material, they um, manage uh, the day-to-day -day activities of the module in collaboration with some researchers and the teaching staffs in our faculty. And of course, um, I think it's an excellent example because the knowledge, the A to Z, the basics that this module contains serve uh, as the basis for our service to the community, which I will explain about uh, later on. As I have mentioned before, the, the transition from bedside to website teaching has emphasized the importance of um, virtual learning spaces. Our faculty use a virtual platform called EMAS, as well as the utilization of many applications like Zoom and Microsoft Teams to hold academic activities. Again, this is not new, I knew that. But the use of virtual learning platforms has never been this important before. Lectures, lectures uh, often upload pre-recorded videos as shown on the left picture, and then we can have a discussion afterwards in the for, uh, discussion forum. And for the practical skills, um, the lecturers and the teaching staffs, they often uh, record um, what uh, they do in daily practice. And then we, the students, uh, need to try to emulate what they do by making videos as well. And the show must go on. So how do we ensure that the quality of the changes um, actually adequate uh, for the teaching and learning activities. These are just another examples. Of course, the transition from traditional to virtual um, based learning, the current teaching and learning methods need constant evaluation. And thus uh, constant feedbacks are given by the students to, to, the, to the faculty. And the faculty uh, often ask students as well uh, regarding our opinion, uh, what can be improved, what um, can be maintained for um, future improvements. Um, these two pictures on the, on the right side uh, are actually my documentaries. Uh, the upper figure show that when we do supervised online history taking, so um, we are um, taking a history on a patient uh, via telemedicine, supervised by a senior uh, by a senior clinician, and then group discussions are, of course, uh, often held virtually. Um, changes in assessment. So adjustments to assessment methods have also been made for our summative examination. The staff supervise us uh, using another device connected to Zoom. And actually, next week, we will have the first moderate to large scale um, OSCEs. Uh, and, this, and this will be held uh, semi-virtually, where um, we will uh, come to the campus, but the examiner and the patient, they will not come direct to, directly to the campus. Uh, they will um, attend the examination via uh, Zoom meeting, virtually, I mean. And then, uh, yeah, they can supervise us later on. So um, what can we learn from this pandemic? It is that changes are inevitable. So what have we done? What lessons have we learned? And what can we as students do? Um, Natasha has 
uh, explained briefly about student engagement, so I will not repeat her explanation on this. And I believe that um, the professors after me will be um, able to explain this concept in a much, much uh, competent way than me. So um, talking broadly, the student engagement refers to the participation of students in many activities. Um, for example, but not limited to education, the management, research, and community activities. And I will elaborate more on what we have done in our faculty, especially in regards to the field of education and community activities. So students, what role can we play? As peers, we know that we are not professionals. We are not professional teachers, we are not experts, and we share um, characteristics with our peers, our other peers, our friends. And we might be involved in creating a variety of learning materials, but of course, these often serve as a supplementary learning materials. For example, we can make educational videos, quizzes, finias, scenarios, notes, and other learning resources. Um, these methods actually increase engagement because we actually feel that we can partake active role in teaching and learning activities. And I will share some of my experience in leading the mentoring division of my, of my Bachelor Department of Academics on how we make um, supplementary learning resources under the supervision of our teaching staffs. So yeah, but um, the role of peers are not limited to uh, the field of academic related activities. For example, the mental health program, as I will explain uh, later on. In my faculty, we have this system called the student support. Uh, this system is composed of many components, uh, including the peers, uh, peer counselors. Uh, for example, I have been trained in Peer, uh, as a peer counselor, and that it also involves the uh, professionals, for example, our lecturers, um, the psychiatrists, the psychologists, the academic advisors, as well as external external sources, for example, to provide finding, uh, fundings for um, uh, those who need it. And um, in facing COVID-19, our faculty has routinely conducted well-being survey and needs assessment, especially for our friends who live in rural areas where quota are provided. And then um, some services are also held virtually. For example, you can do teleconsultation for your mental health. You can do counseling virtually. And then um, some of the students actually help webinars and podcasts by inviting professional speakers in mental health regarding to um, how to cope with this pandemic as well as maintaining our mental health in this pandemic. Um, some educational posters have also been made in collaboration with the faculty, of course, and some videos are also been made. Um, on the left side, I show you what I think is an excellent example of a collaboration between faculty and the students. Uh, this is called Taman Bicara, which means um, a friend to talk with. Um, so Taman Bicara has made a line account in which students can um, chat to the account anonymously, and then um, they, can con they can tell their problems um, to the counselors there. So I think this is a very good example um, on how to engage students more, and then ensuring that uh, the well-being of the students, not only the physical, but the mental health um, is also adequately maintained. Uh, and I'm going to show you the academic activities that we have done in FMUI. So as I mentioned before, our division, the mentoring division, is responsible for making supplementary learning materials. And, and these are made based on survey. And then we seek feedback from the participants uh, to ensure the quality of our resource. For example, these are the synchronous sessions that we held. Um, we have made some presentations and then we um, make a problem set of, out of the formative examination in which we will have a discussion with the other students later on. Um, these are just another examples, the uh, asynchronous videos, and then we uh, I try to um, put some capture on our discussion in, in uh, the session. And we also made uh, some supplementary learning materials, and these are the not to be missed ones, the essential materials that a student must master before they can enter the clinical rotation. So when we made these materials, we are actually consulting our um, teachers and then they give a feedbacks on what their professional, uh, as a professional, what they think is necessary and what they think um, is not necessary. So um, the quality of the supplementary materials are um, well maintained by a direct supervision of our lecturers. Um, these are just another examples of um, what we have made, uh, a standardized lecture notes um, called Tantir in our language. These standardized lecture notes um, are made by a group of 10 uh, students and then it is layouted and quality controlled by a student, uh, after which um, the other students might refer to these lecture notes, especially for things that are clear yet in the uh, lecture. And uh, to try to increase the um, excitement and the engagement with other students, we also made some weekly quizzes. And these quizzes are made uh, with aim uh, so that we can retain the material that we have learned in that week. Um, so yeah, I think this is a very good example 
um, on how we students can uh, actively partake our roles in ensuring that the academic activities still uh, run smoothly. And these are just the steps that we take on how we ensure the quality of our learning sources. So of course, um, we seek feedback from the other two T's. We seek uh, feedback from the lecturers as, as the experts. We um, use credible sources, and then we have a, a quality control division, which controls the quality of our learning sources. To prepare ourselves for our uh, clubship, we also meet some review materials uh, created in an engaging and interactive way. For example, um, the one shown on my slide, uh, it depicts or um, it is uh, it depicts the Spotify interface, uh, so that th that make that makes it more interesting for the students to learn with. We also make some review cards. Uh, these are just another examples. And I think it's an excellent example as well. Um, to accommodate for the lack of direct clinical training, we um, often held virtual training sessions. Um, this one is actually the training on basic surgical skills and circumcision. Um, this one was held by a student organization called the Emergency Relief Team, when uh, surgeons directly observe and give materials first, and then the workshop are guided by experienced senior students. So collaboration is the key with students taking uh, multi-dimensional roles uh, with their, due to their withdrawal from the uh, direct clinical practice. Uh, there are actually no other roles that students can take uh, and the support of the faculty is pivotal. These are just another examples of what we have done uh, in collaboration with our faculty. For example, mass education, debunking of myths and disinformation, production and distribution of logistics, risk communication and tracing, as well as uh, other roles. And I will emphasize this once more that collaboration is key. Um, our faculty has created a team called the FMUI COVID-19 response team composed of many components, uh, many service organizations, all of the students, as well as the uh, teaching staffs and the faculties. And we try to put our knowledge and privilege into action. So how did we do that? We try to give back to the people by um, conducting fundraising acts, by, pro pro uh, by uh, producing and distributing our own logistics. For example, we made our own facials. We um, try to distribute many meals to the hardcore workers. And then we try to educate the laymen as well by debunking hoaxes, misinformation, and disinformation. Uh, this is just another example of what we have done. So we have managed to self-produce PPE. Uh, in this case, it's a face shield. And we have managed to distribute um, the product that we have made to various regional hospitals. And um, in the process, we are supervised by our residents and staffs. And um, these were student-led initiatives. So I think that um, once again emphasizes the important roles of students in the pandemic. These are just another examples. And we have managed to gain media coverage as well. And yeah, every club has a silver lining. This pandemic opens ample opportunities for improvement in medical education. And the important roles of medical students cannot be overlooked at all. And students need to play an active role. Create changes, do not wait for changes. And collaboration and the sense of belonging between students and faculty must be fostered. And this is, I think, a reflection on how we can engage with each other as well. Students need to be engaged in learning, but the teaching staffs need to be engaged in teaching as well. So it goes both ways. And here I would like to acknowledge the people that has made it possible for me to be able to speak here. Thank you, my teachers, Dr. Dianta, Dr. Adi, Dr. Rita, Dr. Asti, Dr. Nadia, my fellow interns, and my team at the Department of Academics and others. I would like to close my presentation by using a quote by my teacher that medical education is basically always about people, whether it's the community that we engage with, the patient that we serve, the um, staffs and the students that we interact with in daily basis, really is basically always with people. So um, thank you. And I would like to close my presentation with a quote that education breeds confidence, confidence breeds hope, and hope breeds peace. And I would like to welcome discussions later on in the session. Thank you very much. OK, thank you very much, Mr. Assis, for a wonderful presentation from Indonesia. I am so really impressed that during the hard time, you still have mind to think of the community and share it with the rest of the of your country. And let's move back to our next uh, representative from the peninsula side of the Asian country. She is the Dean of the Teaching and Learning Chair Assessment Subcommittee of the International uh, Medical University of Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. She is also has experience in curriculum design and development of pharmacy and health science program in the IMU. She has experience in implementation and quality assurance activities of teaching, learning, and assessment in all academic programs in IMU. And she has experience as a fellow of the IMU Center 
for education. Please welcome Professor Er Hui Ming. And so while we are waiting for our uh, speaker to join us now, if you have any question, you can type it in the chat box. The Q&A session will be after the end of the session for about 3 p.m. at GNT plus 7. Uh, the Q&A session will last for about 30 minutes. And you can, if you have any question, please uh, indicate which speaker would you like to ask for. And uh, Professor Laura and Ms. Smith will be available with us also. Oh, here come Professor Er Hui Ming. Welcome you again to our session. The time is yours. Thank you. Right, good afternoon to all. Thank you for inviting me to give a presentation on this topic from the perspectives and experience at the International Medical University, Malaysia. Let me start by giving you the Malaysian scenario during the COVID-19 pandemic. On the 18th of March, uh, 2020, the government announced the lockdown of the cities, which is called the Control Movement Order, MCO, in Malaysia. At the same time, international borders were closed. So within a short period of time, our university had to discuss the strategies and prepare for online learning. The main objective is to enable the students to continue their education so that their progression and graduation is minimally affected. So within three weeks, the faculty worked very hard to get the online teaching materials ready to a satisfactory standard, and all students started online learning on the 6th of April last year. So this also included the conduct of uh, remote online exams. Complete online learning continued for the next three months and from 1st of July 2020, as the situation improved, students were allowed to come back to the campus for some face-to-face -face teaching and learning activities, mainly the skill-based sessions for clinical skills or practical lab practical skills, but strictly following the requirements of physical distancing as well as other SOPs. However, the situation worsened again by the end of September last year and in early October, the government announced another round of conditional lockdown whereby all face-to-face -face teaching and learning activities and exams were suspended again. So as I speak currently, we are still under this um, conditional uh, uh, lockdown. Um, the government in early December announced that the international students, except those from UK, can return to campus from the 1st of January this year. So as you can see, the situation is constantly evolving and it remains very uncertain. The regulations change from time to time and it was a difficult period for all the students as well as the faculty as no one can be certain what's the next plan for sure. So during the, lock, the, the, total, the total lockdown period, these are the uh, examples of online teaching learning activities. First of all, we got all the um, modules to upload the teaching learning uh, materials, the teaching learning guides in the e-learning portal. For plenaries, we had two modes. Uh, it could be online synchronous or online asynchronous sessions. For the asynchronous sessions, the PowerPoint slides, lecture notes, audio recorded lectures, as well as relevant uh, videos, interactive activities were uploaded in the e-learning portal for the students to access. For the synchronous sessions, the Microsoft Teams uh, was uh, used as the platform for the live sessions. And after those uh, sessions, the recorded lectures were actually deposited in the uh, Microsoft Streams, which is a, a repository uh, platform where the students who had difficulty with internet access could um, actually review uh, those materials uh, after the lectures. Q&A sessions were uh, conducted online using the forums as well as using the uh, Microsoft Teams uh, channels, the Teams ch uh, the chats. Formative assessments, activities, interactive activities such as quizzes uh, were made available for the students to uh, attempt to check their understanding. For small group sessions, including PBL, tutorial, workshop, even medical museum uh, sessions, 
the cases, the triggers and instructions were uploaded in the e-learning portal and online synchronous sessions were conducted uh, using the MS Teams. And again, recorded sessions were also shared uh, in case some of the students had difficulty uh, with the internet connection during the live sessions. Q&A sessions were made available uh, uh, in the online forum as well as the uh, chat uh, platform. Clinical skills and lab practical skills, um, since we could not do the face-to-face -face sessions, so the manuals, the data worksheets were uploaded in the e-learning portal. Uh, in some cases, online live demonstrations were conducted using MS Teams. Students were uh, also uh, able to create videos in some cases on, for example, the clinical skills, and these will be submitted to the uh, teachers for review and feedback. Again, Q&A sessions were conducted online uh, via forum and the Teams channels. For attachment and on-site visit, uh, most of them were, uh, were uh, suspended temporarily. And for the time being, related information, recorded videos where relevant were uploaded in the e-learning portal for the students to go through and uh, do some reflections. In some cases, um, the activities were postponed. Student presentation uh, will still be conducted using the online synchronous sessions using the MS Teams. In some cases, uh, the students could submit the recorded presentations using voiceover, PowerPoint slides or videos and share with the rest of the groups, including the facilitators. So in order to support all these online teaching learning activities, the university actually uh, invested uh, heavily to upgrade the IT infrastructure, the hardware and software applications. So it was a trying time for both the faculty and students. First, I'll talk about the challenges faced by the faculty. The level of preparedness for online teaching is different for different programs. In some programs, the online teaching learning materials were not ready at all. So the faculty had to put in a lot of effort within a short period of time to get them ready because uh, the, 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 it only, uh, we were only allowed three weeks to get those uh, materials ready and the online classes resumed uh, when the, uh, the, the lockdown started. This requires IT skills and the, the faculty had to prepare uh, pre-recorded lectures, which means that they had to be familiar with how to uh, create those recorded lectures and also be familiar with the virtual conference platforms such as Zoom or MS Teams. Faculty were also concerned with how to engage the students during the online sessions. For the conduct of online exams, some were only starting to learn to use the online exam system. Exam integrity is another concern, especially during the total lockdown period, when the students had to take the exams remotely from their homes, which means that the exams might not be invigilated. Open book exams seem to be a viable option, but faculty would need to be trained to design the questions. Even with the availability of online proctoring software, the issues of confidentiality, um, privacy and trust were brought up. At the same time, with online exams, the technical glitches could not be ruled out. So the invigilators had to be trained to handle these problems promptly without affecting the conduct of the exams. Another important question is, were the students ready for the online learning? As this could be a new experience for some, if not most of the students. For the students, the challenges have been uh, uh, brought up uh, by Natasha as well as Aziz earlier. So this included the access to computer or laptops. Some students didn't have their personal computers. And so uh, we had to uh, make it very clear what are the specification requirements for them to, uh, for the computers or the laptops, for them to be able to access to the online uh, learning. The, some students were also having um, difficulty accessing the internet or maybe uh, having a stable internet at home. Some students actually never logged into the e-learning platform before the COVID-19. So they had to make sure that the login access 
uh, was working. And they also need to have the skill sets, the IT skills and also learn online learning skills, which requires a lot of uh, time management skills and also self-motivation, in fact. The engagement with faculty and peers was a concern for the students because they now don't see each other face-to-face. -face. So uh, a lot of them were, were a bit concerned how they are going to engage with the faculty if they have questions and also the collaboration with the peers. Computer screen fatigue was another uh, concern because of the continuous uh, uh, online sessions uh, that could cause uh, fatigue with the students, and so timetabling was an issue. There were also concerns with the online exams, uh, whether the students were prepared for the questions in open book exams, as well as support for technical glitches during the exam, as well as the privacy uh, issues. Other concerns include the quality of online teaching because not all faculty were trained uh, exp and experienced with online teaching. And so there were some issues with the quality. And there's also a uh, concern with delay in semester progression as well as graduation for some students. A lot of students were also worried whether um, this uh, interruption to their learning will affect the program accreditation as well as their preparedness for practice later on. So how did we go through this situation? We conducted surveys, lots of surveys, not only to assess the readiness of the faculty for online teaching, but also the readiness of the students for online learning. We did two student surveys in March and June last year. The response rate was not bad, 62% and 54% respectively. And we could see that the students were very eager to give feedback, especially negative feedback. However, that was a positive thing indeed because it helped us to uh, improve. For the surveys, we identified the areas of attention that we must improve on and that were in the uh, areas of organization of the learning resources in the e-learning portal timetabling, quality of online teaching and resources, as well as IT and technical issues such as internet access and downloading time. So that led to a four-pronged approach to improve the student experience with online learning. At the institution level, the IT infrastructure were upgraded. That included the hardware and software, and guidelines for online teaching and learning were developed and these uh, were applicable to all programs and that could be used by all schools uh, as the reference materials for their preparation of online teaching learning. KPIs were set to help the faculty to uh, improve the quality of online teaching and the student evaluation was continuously monitored. For the faculty, a lot of trainings and faculty, faculty development activities were organized, uh, especially on how to conduct online teaching, how to engage the students during those uh, sessions, how to design uh, online uh, uh, instructional materials, as well as uh, designing questions for online open book exams. So faculty were busy preparing for online teaching materials and uh, at the same time, uh, improve and deliver quality online teaching. For the professional staff, uh, they were uh, very helpful in helping to reorganize the e-learning portal so that the, the uh, learning resources, the online resources were uh, more accessible easily, more user-friendly. They provided training and support to staff and students on IT skills as well as e-learning skills. A lot of SOPs were developed for online learning, timetabling, as well as conduct of exams, and on student support, as well as counselling. For the students, they were invited to uh, rounds and rounds of town hall meetings uh, to receive updates and to give their feedback. Student representatives were, were included in all the curriculum assessment committees and also QA committees. So this, this uh, representatives actually uh, act as the bridge between the student, 
to the students and the faculty in ensuring that the student voices are heard and taken into consideration for decision making in terms of online learning as well as exams. One of the initiatives we introduced during the online learning is the live evaluation of online teaching by the students. That was launched uh, in July 2020 as part of the initiative to improve and enhance the teaching learning uh, online. It was to obtain immediate feedback from the students at the end of every online session via an online link. The processing of these evaluation reports were done within 24 hours after the synchronous online lecture ends and within three days the, the, after the asynchronous online lecture ends. So the faculty were able to get these uh, reports immediately and they were able to look at the feedback and improve. These are the areas that were uh, evaluated by the students uh, on the clarity of the learning outcomes, as well as uh, whether the lecturer explains the points in a logical and clear manner, whether the activities during the online uh, uh, session was interactive, and whether they, they were activities to check uh, their understanding, whether the key learning points were summarized clearly at the end of the lecture, and overall satisfaction. And open comment section was included. So how did we go with this uh, on uh, live evaluation? We comparing we, this this online evaluation reports were processed of, uh, timely, and in July 2020, when we first started, only three percent of the faculty were evaluated by the students uh, because this uh, evaluation was voluntary. All of the faculty being evaluated received overall rating of four and above which means it is uh, satisfactory or strongly satisfactory. In December, after six months, 60% of the faculty were evaluated. It means that more students felt free to participate and give their evaluation. And among the evaluated faculty, 90% of them received overall rating of four and above. So this uh, live evaluation and with the immediate uh, feedback actually was very useful because faculty could address the areas of weakness in online teaching promptly based on the feedback and they could improve before the next uh, online teaching session. As a consequence, there were reduced number of complaints from the students on the quality of online teaching. So this live evaluation uh, actually provided a very safe environment for the students to give their genuine feedback. And that is very important. The COVID-19 pandemic also created an opportunity for the students to self-reflect during this unprecedented time. This is an article written by a year three medical student, Khadija Abdullah, on online learning, how you perceive a situation can do wonders for how you adapt to it. I quote from her article, I must say, here, it says that he, she said that at the end of the day, it really comes down to how one reacts and perceives a situation, and that makes all the difference in the world. Train your mind to see good in every situation and take it from there. I must say, as an educator, it is gratifying to see that students are able to see the positive side of any situation that they are in and seize every learning opportunity from the experience, be it good or bad. So my take home message from our experience are that continuous communication is crucial as the situation is fast evolving and it remains uncertain. Different strategies should be uh, developed to engage students depending on their needs and level of maturity. Year one students need could be different, very different from the final year students. So we, we should have multiple strategies to um, engage them. Students should be encouraged to be active partners in delivery of medical education. And students' voice is crucial to enhance the collective student ex learning experience. Students play an important role in ensuring the quality of medical education. We should encourage more student 
faculty partnership in quality assurance processes and decision making in the delivery of medical education. I'm pleased to share that we have published an article on this in the Korean Journal of Medical Education based on a study done at our institution. The findings indeed provide many strong evidences to support student engagement in QA. I'll end my talk here. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Professor Er, for your presentation. And uh, I'm so delighted that uh, we all in the Asian country are moving forward in the same direction that uh, we hear much from our students uh, comparing from the past. So let's move to our last but not least speakers from the National University of Singapore. He is the Vice Provost in Teaching Innovation and Quality at the National University of Singapore and also the Senior Consultant Neurologist at the National University Hospital Singapore. His uh, field of interest is movement disorder, medical education and technology in education. He has experience as Assistant Dean of Education, Yong Lu Lin School of Medicine, National University of Singapore, and also the Chairman of the Executive Council of the NUS Teaching Academy. Welcome, Associate Professor Er Lin Chun Hian. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, can I just check that? Can someone just tell me if you can't hear me? Otherwise, I will, I will have to do something with the computer. But uh, I thought I would talk about COVID-19 and other disruptions to education and how we should ensure meaningful student engagement, uh, authentic learning and assessment. So uh, just a little bit about NUS, we are 115 this year. We have about 35,000 students uh, and we have about 17 faculties and schools. Uh, so we are a rather large university and well, for Asia, quite an old one. Uh, my portfolio actually involves overseeing five units uh, in NUS, the Center for Instructional Technology, which deals with all the uh, edutech uh, functions of, of NUS, uh, the Center for Development of Teaching and Learning, which has to do with, uh, which has to do with pedagogy, uh, all set, which is uh, a unit that looks at educational research and what we call a data lake. The NUS Teaching Academy, which has to do with uh, our teachers who are uh, very, very education minded and who uh, form a think tank in our library. Uh, actually, for many years, uh, I've sort of been looking at traditional bricks, bricks and mortar universities within the world. If you look at you know, very, very well established ones like uh, Madrid or Toledo or Oxford, Cambridge, etc., you realize that that kind of model of education is fast becoming, uh, is fast uh, facing threats. And in fact, if you look at all the online portals like edX, Coursera, and now even online universities, uh, even schools like Oxford have now jumped on the bandwagon and are putting out not only materials on edX and Coursera, et cetera, but also on their own platforms. So it's become very important to rethink how universities should be uh, pushing out education, engaging our students. Uh, I mean, COVID-19 is what we are all talking about. But anyway, uh, Singapore was actually, well, fortunate or not, we, we actually faced SARS in 2003. And that really was uh, the first disruption we had uh, to our education. But in Singapore, SARS was only about six months. And fortunately for us at the time, it, our exams were not affected, just teaching. So we scrambled at that time and came up with online education measures. And in fact, subsequently, over the next few years, uh, and in 2007, we mandated an online learning week so that everybody will be familiar with how to do education online should the need arise again. And indeed, that, that need continued to arise. I think the problem, though, was that although we became very good at online education, we weren't so good at online assessments because assessments were so important. And although we tried to build up the ability to, to do online education, it became very difficult at the same time to, to also do an online exam for the whole university because it was such a high-stakes event. Anyway, uh, you know, whatever, uh, however we look at it, 
you know, pandemics are here to stay from SARS to H1N1 to MERS to COVID. We can expect the next pandemic to happen. Uh, one of my friends uh, commented that COVID actually is like an extinction event, not only for, for universities, but for the whole world. And if you look at the number of companies that have gone bankrupt or have filed for bankruptcy, and even universities which have now sought funding from, uh, from government agencies, uh, if you think about how, because of uh, the inability of students to travel for education, you realize it's going to be very difficult for many universities dependent on external funding from international students to continue to function. So indeed, COVID uh, and other pandemics to come will be extinction events if we do not evolve. If you think about how, uh, if you think about how uh, something like this, uh, you know, this is where's Wally. And for those of you who are trying to figure out where Wally is, as I would do if I were listening, uh, he's here. But you know, if you think about how we've always run education, it's always been very crowded lectures. And although blended learning and uh, massive open online courses have been around for many years now, many of our universities and schools are still not availing themselves of this opportunity. But COVID has certainly mandated uh, that we start you know, moving into very distance groups and wear masks, et cetera. And this actually has made things difficult in delivering education. Uh, if you think about it also, you know, during the COVID, uh, in fact, I mean, we're all still in it, but uh, many universities, when it first broke out, just closed up and asked everyone to go home. And in fact, in our university, we suddenly had students on exchange programs who were forced to come back and we had to find, we had to scramble to bring them back. So, you know, with school closure, we also had to think about not only online education, which was easy, uh, but because students couldn't come to campus, we had to um, scramble to get computers for those who did not have computers at home. We had to get good online access for them at home because they were all doing things at home. And also for exams, because some of them had unreliable sites, despite the fact that the government did not allow people to come into campus, uh, just as we were emerging from the lockdown, we were able to get spaces, socially distanced, mask wearing, with temperature declarations, etc., where students could take their exams reliably. I mean, there were other problems as well. Uh, so anyway, you know, if you look at it, we went online, and that we were already good at. But I was worried because this now came under me, and I just, uh, I just took on this new role in uh, teaching innovation and quality in the last. Uh, since April. Uh, before that, I was doing undergraduate education and technology, but now everything came under me. And we were worried about online cheating because, you know, if you look at how all registrar's offices think about exams, it's always, oh, I'm going to do, uh, is it open book or closed book? And what many people fail to realize is it's not just open book or closed book, but even with an open book exam, people do not collaborate illegally. Whereas once you're home, you're allowed to do that. So we set up all these WhatsApp chats, which I'm sure all of you have as well. And using my office as the center of all the connections, we looked at all the partners that we had to engage. So this was within our Edutech unit, uh, Center for Instructional Technology and NUSIT, which is an other co another computing unit, our registrar's office and all the different deaneries. And in addition, we had to look at, engage the students who were partners, as well as vendors like, like uh, Zoom or, the, the telcos, and we had to make sure that one, for our internal exam and plan, planning and logistics, we had a group. We also reached out to all these vendors and said, look, in about a month, we're going to have online exams. You have to ensure that the exams are glitch free. And we know that glitches will happen, but we wanted it to be that if anything happens, we would have immediate access to them and to have them rectified. And of course, we had all these managing expectations, planning of exams. So we also asked the students at, and teachers at the time, look, in view of this, it's, it's a mad scramble in a month. Do you really need a high stakes exam? So we, for those who did not really need it, we, we, thought that we asked them to think of other ways to supplement the exams. And if you really need it, then how will you run it? Do you need proctoring? Yes or no? And also with the different kinds of complexity of exams, how are you going to run it? So the first time around in April, May, when we ran our exams, about, thir about 38% of our exams are proctored. Uh, and I'll tell you a little bit about what happened then. 
But in our last run in about a month ago, we about 83% of our exams were proctored and our cheating rate decreased markedly. So we were actually very lucky. We had very few cheating cases except for uh, pre-exam two community uh, two assessments where students cheated and they were caught and punished severely. But in our exams, we haven't had that many. But anyway, as we were running the exams, we said, look, online exams, proctoring, but we told our teachers, as far as possible, set on uh, open book exams, make sure you, uh, you ask questions that, uh, uh, that require application of knowledge, uh, no recall type of questions. Instead, we asked them to get patient questions that would uh, require application of knowledge, randomize the questions and the answer options, and justify the answers. In addition, we made them do test runs, trial runs, so that we could work out all the glitches within the university in large exam scales, but also for the teachers themselves to be familiar with what to do. As we emerged from the lockdown, it became a matter of distanced, uh, distancing and limited coming back to campus, but we now realize we have to think about a, a hybrid system. So we said nobody will be left behind. We told the students we'll do everything we could for them. And in fact, we have online uh, systems within NUS too, and Singapore to track your whereabouts, to make sure you're safe, you have no fever before you come to campus, etc. And then we started planning the new normal, which was a hybrid system. Whether you're in campus or out, you assume some people will be out of campus and therefore we need to have online assessments. Uh, we, we actually said that even though it, we were preparing for the, con the COVID pandemic and what to do then, uh, even as we emerge from this in the next year, we realize that things are going to happen again and again, new mutations, new viruses, other situations. So we, we said from now on, we are going to push for more blended learning, more uh, opportunities for hybrid learning. So why? Because pandemics are here to stay. Willing, uh, working parents, and in fact, our teachers will also need flexi hours for learning. We have lots of international students. Uh, we have asked them to avail themselves of our tech-enhanced tools, which I'll tell you about later. And we like online blended learning because it is own time, own target. You do it as you need it. But our campus is also quite wide widespread. Within the, our large campus, we also have several other auxiliary campuses within Singapore. So we said, look, now we're going to need to rethink le uh, learning, rethink examinations. And actually, we also realized uh, with, with regards to proctoring that everyone was jumping on the COVID bandwagon. We had companies that did not normally do uh, proctoring or were just starting out, and they were frankly not ready for us in April. So we had to come up with our own proctoring solution, which was to use Zoom. And we had teachers break out into rooms. We had our normal admin people coming in as invigilators to watch the students during the exams. And we had some technical glitches, but we ran multiple uh, training sessions so that during the exam itself, it was relatively stress-free. We also had multiple ways for the students to contact us should anything happen during the exam. So you see, it required a lot of out-of-the-box thinking for the exam. Not only how we, re we deliver education, but how we do our assessments and exams. So I'll just tell you a little bit about some of what we did. This is uh, my good friend, So Chong Hao, who's a physics professor. And uh, I've been telling him about one of my uh, godsons who is uh, a five-year-old kid who loves science. And I bought for him these kits that uh, deliver uh, either physics or chemistry stuff to him. And he's so excited. So Chong Hao took this idea and in fact really expanded on it. He sent experiments to all his students using our postal services and they were able to do chemistry experiments. This chap is Siva. And he is a biologist, eco uh, ecologist, uh, biodiversity expert, and he's an expert internationally on the smooth-coated otters that we have in Singapore. And he has been finding ways to run virtual tours of our flora and fauna in Singapore, as well as now to do socially distanced, masked, but grouped uh, tours so that he keeps track of the people, nobody gets lost, and yet he's able to do that. But, you know, with all of this virtual stuff, all of this technology-assisted thing, one of my Vice Dean said to me when I was telling them that we need to push more blended, more online, that you cannot create a biologist just by making him watch or her watch David Attenborough videos. And so actually it, it, it also was very, it also resonated with me because as a doctor, I know that you cannot make a doctor just by doing online learning. You can't really assess someone online. 
That being said, you know, this this was a, a, a cartoon that was sent around to all of us at the time that, you know, you, if, if you if you have an online trained doctor and an online assessed doctor, what you get is someone who only knows how to do things on the computer. So within our medical school, you know, we were trying to figure out how also to get this done because you there's no substitute for the the face to face, the, the gentle touch of a doctor, the interaction. And in fact, you know, we have simulators around. And in fact, in, in NUS, we have this simulator, which is an abdominal simulator created by our group called Ape the Tummy Dummy with plug and play organs. But you see, we have so many different kinds of mannequins and we should use these things when there is a pandemic and even in training. It's just that you don't want it to be the only thing that is done. This was something we did together with uh, Carnegie Mellon University. This is Ape the Tummy Dummy, but we used HoloLens and created an online system for an avatar so that the students could see different things within Ape. For example, in this case, you have liver cirrhosis and you have jaundice with spider nevi, gynecomastia, etc. And then because the students said to me that when they examine the abdomen, they cannot see what's in it. We created this thing called x-ray so that as they examine and feel the spleen or liver, they get to see what they are touching. So that was useful. Uh, because of COVID and because our medical school was so heavily involved in running wards, etc., we also developed robotic doctors to go into the room so that there'll be minimal exposure, although the doctors still did go in, and also telemedicine, which become has become a very important and very uh, it's a necessary evil, but there's no substitute for a, a, a real doctor, right? So the other thing we did was we had our students don PPE, which is important for the future. They are going to be in situations and make them learn how to address patients to examine them in these situations. So, I mean, the other thing we did for exams, for et cetera, uh, et cetera our students were no longer allowed to roam around Singapore and and try different, uh, try, try different uh, disciplines within different units in, in different hospitals. Instead, they were assigned to one hospital and have had to stay there over the whole year. So you see, um, this is, if for those of you who haven't seen this before, this is a redesigned man. What kind of a human would be able to survive a car accident? So we really need to rethink our design. Just as if you go to uh, restaurants now, they've redefined the spaces within a restaurant. I mean, this is a little bit, uh, claustrophobic to me, but you know we are in order to survive. In order for businesses to survive, we've had to rethink. So in fact, you know uh, we are also looking forward to how we are going to address education in the future. So we are thinking of what we are calling CALT or computerized adaptive learning and testing, and this will be basically all the core skills knowledge points that we have in every year. We're going to develop a system with all these core competencies for students to be tested at every turn, to be streamed not so much to see, to get the good together and the bad together, but to remediate those who need help. And for those who are good to perhaps even accelerate them through their courses so that they can finish their exams faster and perhaps even go on to other things. And of course, for those who are do very well, doing very well, we might even select them for PhDs and uh, master's degrees, et cetera. So we've also looked at redesigning learning spaces. And not only are we thinking now for COVID, because this will pass, but how can we get all our lecture theaters, learning spaces up to what is a basic level of, of necessary function? Because many lecture theaters, if you think about it, have not changed very much since the time of Shako or, or you know, one of the, the legendary teachers that we've had. So I'm going to finish very soon, but let me just show you. This is our Imaginarium, uh, something we created about three years ago. It's a space within our central library where you can go in and try out different tech toys from robotics to AR to VR to mixed reality to uh, 4D, 4D VR, four-dimensional virtual reality. And our students have been able to go there. Now, of course, we limit the number of visitors. We use ultrasound to, sorry, ultraviolet to clean the devices or use alcohol to clean everything in between the trials, but it's still a very popular place to go. And of course, within medical schools, you're, you're all aware of things like this. Uh, this is actually uh, something on edX. We have a MOOC on NU from NUS on how to deal with children. And in addition to the MOOC, you can actually view 
the world through the eyes of the child so that you know what it's like to be a child who's ignored or who is fearful and yet people don't address your fears. And of course, this is uh, Oculus Rift uh, and how you can look at safety within a, uh, operating theater. So we have a lot of uh, technology. Oops, sorry. We have a lot of technology that we are using. Uh, oh, good heavens. Sorry about that. Uh, there's a lot of technology that we're using within, uh, oh dear, I'm so sorry, I don't know what happened. But anyway, there's a lot of technology that we're using within uh, university uh, and our medical schools, and we're trying our very best to uh, to get this done. I'm really sorry, I don't know what button I pressed, but suddenly everything went crazy. Uh, I'm about to finish anyway. So uh, in addition to all of these things, we need to show we need to think about how we can reimagine education. It cannot just be that we use technology, right? So we have edX, uh, we are on edX and Coursera. We have now, this is the edX MOOC on uh, healthcare and education and how to engage children. We have also used edX MOOCs within NUS and we are flipping them on campus so that our students are able to avail themselves of the best uh, in the world either as part of their own knowledge or as uh, as uh, or within structured classes within NUS. This is something that we just created. It's called Genius Channel and Genius Books. Uh, the genius is not so much uh, uh, an, an arrogance uh, thing, but more an aspirational thing, where we're stating that within NUS, we're all aspiring to be geniuses. But it allows us to have TED Talks. It allows us to have teachers who show ad hoc teaching opportunities and that is something that we are quite happy about. Uh, our Genius Books is actually a way for our teachers to create online materials with multimedia for the students. And in fact, we're encouraging our students to develop their own uh, materials to share as well as to for the sake of their homework. So as you see, it's an evolutionary process in medicine and in education in the university. We are now heading towards uh, using technology in very engaging ways but of course it must not replace the, what the real value of education is uh, with that i thank you and uh, i'm happy to take questions later on thank you okay thank you very much professor uh, uh so now we have a question from professor laura and miss smith uh the question is given that the pandemic further widened the gap for accessibility to vulnerable groups and highlighted the challenge uh, faced certain groups in the community or the minorities. How has the delivery changed, for example, addressing the inclusivity and diversity in clinical learning results? So I'll, I'll start with a, a sort of breaking that into two parts. There's two levels to um, that kind of vulnerability. Undoubtedly, the gaps have widened across all of society um, within the UK. I'm sure that we're not unique in that. But we also have students who live in multi-generational households and come from what we describe as widening participation backgrounds, so non-traditional backgrounds into medicine. And there the students have struggled as we have pivoted to a more online and simulated um, educational system with such things as sharing internet access, bandwidth, um, you know, if there are other children being homeschooled and so on, and actually also accessibility to potentially sensitive clinical materials. So we've had to think rapidly about how we do not increase any differentials within our student cohort. Um, so we've been working with some of our clinical partners to make sure that we are creating, where possible, prioritised space on campus or, with, or within cold clinical areas for students to be able to access resources. That's still work that's ongoing. Um, in terms of our diversity of materials, I mean, my colleague Laura will describe a little bit more about some of the work we're doing there. But this is going to be the transformative element of the pandemic as we address um, our curricula and ensure that they are truly inclusive and represent the communities that we serve. And there's a number of ways in which we're thinking about doing that. The most obvious um, at the moment is in our virtual primary care um, resource, which enables us 
probably for the first time to genuinely have that inclusive teaching across a range of conditions, age groups, demographic, um, multimorbidities and so on. That is still in the evaluation stage. It went live in September, October. Um, and there are large, there'll be large research programs that follow from that because of course what we're doing as we have pivoted to a much more hybrid and online and simulated learning in this first urgent phase of the pandemic, we have to make sure that we are genuinely adding value and that we understand what works, why it works and how we leverage that in future. I think Laura will be able to talk a bit more about some of the more specific resources that we've done. Um, yeah, so I, I think there's a huge amount of work gone on in the curriculum in terms of developing um, sort of work around inequalities in health and also looking at sort of vulnerable groups. And that's something that we continue to work on with the students, um, particularly around sort of simulation and embedding that in all aspects of the curriculum. Um, I, I think one of the other things I picked up in the question was around sort of our own vulnerable students and how we've addressed the needs of those students. Um, and certainly um, that's been a, a, the well-being of our students has really been a priority um, and we've risk assessed our students um, in terms of their, their own individual risk factors um, and supported those students that have required additional help, not just like Laura said, from a widening participation perspective, but also from a personal health needs um, perspective. And, and we've adapted and personalised particularly some of the more practical face-to-face -face elements of the curriculum for those students um, and, and have been able to, to do that, which um, I really think has, has helped the students engage with us in terms of the, the processes that we've had to go through to, to keep the programme running and to keep the students in placement. One of the other things our student body has very much led in engagement with is actually wanting to respond to our more vulnerable and local communities. Um, and in fact, one of the things that happened quite early in the pandemic was we had to um, cancel the um, international elective period for students and we actually swapped parts of our curriculum around and actually our elective um, became very much focused on a more community-based um, set of projects. Some were actually part of you know, the, the clinical environment but actually it was about addressing some of those issues that were surfacing um, for our local populations as well. So that's been quite successful. And certainly our students have been in the vanguard um, in terms of actually wanting to use this opportunity to change. In fact, we have, um, you know, we've got a series of kind of, you know, sort of semi-conferences, workshops to enable us to leverage this a little bit more quickly as well. And Laura's been leading the work with Proxime as well, which we described. Um, you know, so we're using a range of both technological, um, you know, sort of standard but more creative ways of, of using our clinical skill center and so on. And Laura's been in the vanguard of that, thinking about what actually has to be done face to face, listening to your previous speaker, and actually what, you know, that not losing that human interaction. Another part of our um, sort of work has been we have a 200 strong patient carer community who work with our students um, generally on a face to face basis and they act as mentors to students, they act as, um, in some cases, translator for local dialogue, you know, they sort of really work with our students and they also bring their lived experience of long-term health conditions. So we've had to um, work to make sure that the digital divide um, does not impact on the ability of that work to continue. And I have to say that's been one of our great successes, that students have really got derived huge benefits from still being able to interact, albeit in a slightly different way, online with our patient care community in the variety of roles that they have from simulated patients to communication skills facilitators to mentors. So I think you know that's something that we perhaps hadn't necessarily anticipated, but providing that training and enabling people, which often meant asking our university to do different things in terms of accessibility and providing equipment for people to be able to work. And that's the other thing that there was a divide in who has what equipment and what facilities to be able to work remotely. And you can't take any of that for granted. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, I have heard that you mentioned the programmatic assessment that will be the key to the pandemic now. So would you please explain a little bit about what is the programmatic assessment, please? Laura, do you want to take that? Yeah. Um so um, one of our colleagues, um, Dr. Jen Hallam, who's our head of assessment, leads on this work. But 
essentially what we're doing is we're looking at students through the whole, whole of the programme and looking at a, them from a longitudinal perspective. Um, so the focus is less on finals exams, but more about assessing students through the programme. Um, and that's assessment of knowledge, but also assessment of skills within the workplace. Um, so we have a very well established workplace based assessment strategy um, for students in all years. Um, and the data that we have um, collected on students throughout the programme was sort of fundamental in, in helping us to graduate our students um, last year. Um, and really, we're looking to develop that further. And that's work that Dr. Hallam's leading on. So just to add, because of that work that has been ongoing for, you know, for several years now, and, and again, we have Clinical Skills Passport, which is very much led by Laura, um, you know, we, we were able to review when our government asked us to graduate students into the first wave to support the NHS as interim foundation doctors, um, we were able to graduate a large number of our students without a final OSCE because we had sufficient data to be able to map to the GMC requirements. The regulator did not make any adjustments to what was required. Um, and actually we've learned a huge amount about, you know, that in time assessment, what is appropriate and how we might use that to go forward. Because across, you know, certainly across the UK assessment burden on students is very high and it's very difficult. You know, you assess more and more, but actually what's, what's the purpose of it and does that really make you more safe and competent and what are those minima? And actually then, I think as was described before, how do you then encourage students to be able to use that time to really focus on the things that add value to their work as future clinicians and global citizens? Okay, thank you. And uh, for the for the medical school that has a size of about 100 medical students that haven't been prepared in the past for the programmatic assessment and suddenly the pandemic come, what is your advice on how to maintain the validity of the student assessment in the COVID-19 situation? Is that a like question? That, like that, uh, they're going to they're going to have to do the summative examination for 100 medical students at the same time without any prior assessment before in the past. And they so, cannot change. And they cannot change. From, uh, yes, yes, please. Yes. So um, I think that's a, that's a very difficult question, actually, if you've not got data um, before, you, you need to be able to demonstrate that students have meet your outcomes framework and your the criteria. So I think if you wanted more detail on actually how you could be creative, I would certainly be we'd be very well you'd be very welcome to contact us with um, you know for advice. And I'm sure Dr. Hallam would be delighted to be able to advise you on that. It's probably not something that we can do in a short answer now. Okay. And what's really nice about this is we would really like as I think as we said in our presentation, what we know is we've got huge amounts to learn from others we've probably got learning that we can share. And if we can all come together in the service of medicine and patient care, that would be a fantastic outcome of this rather challenging and extraordinary time. And a uh, question for all of speakers. Uh, I have seen that you have combat many, many aspects of the pan pandemic that affect your learning and teaching. So what is the ch challenges that you still have in teaching, learning and assessment after one year of coping with the pandemic? What remain unresolved? Any speaker, please? Any speaker want to share? You can raise your hands. So maybe Pro Professor Meng, please. Uh, I would think that the issues that are remaining unresolved is still um, online. Uh, how much, how ready are our faculty and students for online learning? You know, what happened in, during the uh, last few months is that we basically just converted everything to online learning, but we we didn't really have the time to actually go through and uh, really carefully select. Perhaps certain learning outcomes are more suitable for online learning, and first certain topics are still, you know, face to face are, are still the primary uh, mode of teaching learning. So that I think we need 
we, we, we actually need to go through and discuss in details, um, you know, before we make a decision on the way forward. Because under the new norm uh, practice, I think uh, online learning is to stay, uh, but we got to be uh, more careful in uh, our planning. So okay. I think, so, uh, sorry, I've just said something. One of the things I think that we still have to um, really think through is certainly about student well-being um, when they don't have their normal social interaction, which we know has been incredibly important in the work that we do, um, and ensuring that they can create their communities of practice and that longitudinal centre, you know, not just within peer group but near peer as well and I think we have to really think about how we engineer um, and ensure that that still happens. We have mentorship programs, we've invited some of our recent graduates back to support, we've got a new tranche of educational supervisors for our year fives, our final year students um, and I think we can't just see this as something that suddenly stops. Um, I think um, you know this pandemic isn't going to end you know with a you know, kind of, as our Prime Minister said, with a bang, it's going to limp on for some time. And I think our students are facing the most difficult challenge that any of us have had to face. Um, you know, and in the UK, it's, it's you know, it's very difficult. Yeah, thank you. And Professor Shunhyun, please. Sorry. I would say it's still authentic assessment. Uh, I mean, since the rest of them have already commented uh, I think in medical education, there's no substitute for a real live patient. And so not having a, a patient present would actually be very difficult to manage. The other thing is actually, even if you have an online exam where it's just MCQs or essays or whatever, having an exam where people are not in, uh, not, uh, doing the exam in person. I mean, computer-based testing is very different from purely online assessment, remote from the exam site. And that's where cheating happens. So, you know, proctoring is something that is here to stay. People are, are very impressed with it. But uh, one, for the student, true proctoring, which is sit in front of the computer, don't move your head. Any remote thing is, uh, anything that happens around you gets questioned. It's going to be equally difficult for the teachers as the students. Students get so frightened that they can't even move in their place. And the poor teacher who is assessing the exam has to actually go through hundreds of events per student per exam where little things are identified. So unless you have an artificial intelligence platform that can help you to assess, proctor, uh, to proctor properly, it's still something not, that's not going to be well done. So in fact, all these online assessment platforms uh, that we have, uh, you know, Udemy, uh, FutureLearn, whatever, none of them does online exams well. They do teaching well, not the assessments. Anyway, thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Chun Hien. And uh, for our medical students, two of you, do you have any, any ideas to share, please? So maybe Ms. Natasha, are you ready? Okay. So yes, I would, I would like to add on what um, Professor Earl said earlier about the assessment. Um, I would like to highlight that empathy is also one aspect that um, can be, it is really, really hard to be evaluated and assessed, right? But it is, we can always see that it is the crucial element of being a doctor we need to care and of our patients, right? And the online learning and using technology keeps us more distant every single day. And the prolonged working from home, I think that's gonna harm us in when uh, when we teach and how we learn and how we cultivate empathy towards each other, like from the medical student and the patient, and also the empathy within the medical professionals. Thank you. Thank you very much. And, and any any question, any idea from Mr. Asis? 
Um, yeah, I would also like to add about accessibility since some of my friends actually live in rural areas of Indonesia and it might interfere with accessibility to the virtual learning spaces. And I also agree with what Professor Laura Stroud said that um, many of my peers are struggling actually. And this highlights the importance of um, peer and near peer support um, even more. And um, I also agree with what Patacha said that um, fostering humanities and cultural competence also serves to be a challenge in this pandemic. But um, in the other side, we can also say that um, this, the occurrences that happen in this pandemic might also be a chance for us to foster our humanities even more. So any other speakers, do you want to share anything else? I think for us with our students, um, what's happened is there has been a surge in their understanding about those inequalities in the UK. And that has really, that will really help us with our curriculum refresh. And I think as Laura said, there was already work going on, but sometimes in normal times, you know, students are very focused on, you know, their, 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 their practical and their competency outcomes. And now that I think that there is an opportunity in that compassion and empathy space for us to really think differently. Um, and I'm really hoping and hopeful that actually the technology and the things that we've learned about what we do need to do and more crucially what we perhaps don't need to do in the same way will give us space to be able to think that through. And I think that's the, um, you know, I think someone else said, you know, this will not be the only pandemic that we face, but if we don't learn from this one, then we, we will be poorer as a profession and, you know, as a, you know, as medical educators, we, we, are, we are advocates for our patients and that means we have to advocate for our students and be driven by our students as well. Okay, thank you very much, all distinguished speakers. I have learned that uh, we have improved our student engagement process uh, more than ever. And this is a good thing that we have been prepared for this pandemic for several years ago. And we, we think that I, I do think that we can uh, learn more and more from each other and prepare and develop our profession in the future. Uh, we will not be like the old normal, but the new normal might be the way that we will have to find out all together. So thank you very much, all distinguished guests. It will be, so, I am so honored to be your moderator for today and think that every delegate will be learn something new, many, many things new from today's session. Thank you very much. Thank you and hope to find you all again in the next time meeting of the Asian Medical Education Alliance webinar, or if we are lucky, we could do it again on site, face to face, and also with the online platform since the, the COVID situation changed us forever. Thank you very much. Thank you. Cop Queen Club and also Saudi Club. Thank you. Thank you so much. Stay safe, everyone.